I'm Belle Alderman, and I'm very, very pleased to have all of you here tonight and to welcome you on behalf of the Lou Reese Archives that's organized this conference and also on behalf of the University of Canberra. We're very pleased to have you here. So this will be a very special evening for us. And what we're doing is we're celebrating Canberra's creative writers and illustrators. The slides that you see on the screen are of all the books that these authors and illustrators have created, a large number of them. A couple of exhibitions outside and the artwork on the walls are from the Lou Reese archive. So we hope that you'll have a little look before you go. So I'd now like to introduce the Vice Chancellor, Stephen Parker. Thank you, Belle, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the University of Canberra. Welcome to this showcase, the second annual festival of Australian children's literature, which celebrates writers, illustrators, and publishers connected with the capital region who create children's books. Before I go further, I'd like to acknowledge that the land we are meeting on is land of which the Ngunnawal people are the traditional custodians. I extend my respect to their elders past and present and to all indigenous people here this evening. And so that those words are not simply a ritual, I should add that um, just 24 hours ago in this room, we had the annual UC Ngunnawal lecture delivered by Dr. Chris Sara, um, who spoke on the theme of raising expectations of indigenous children in literacy and numeracy. And it's appropriate, I think, that this event comes a day later. I'd like to acknowledge in particular the presence this evening of the Honourable John Folkes, Deputy Chief Justice of the Family Court of Australia and Chair of the Lou Rees Archives Board, and Angela Bryant, National President of the Children's Book Council of Australia. And welcome you all, authors, avid readers, educators, school and public librarians, parents, young people, and fans of children's literature, whatever your age. And it's great to welcome you to a booked out event. Uh, last year's inaugural festival attracted over 1,200 people to the Lou Rees archives, and we have another large crowd here this evening. This year's festival has a number of aims, to explore imaginative work for children created by local writers, illustrators, and publishers, to inspire Canberra's students and the general community through creators' talks, events, book signings, and exhibitions, to connect local authors and illustrators to each other, to their local community and their communities of interest, to explore the imaginative process of creating books through exhibitions, talks, and activities, to exhibit unique original artworks and manuscripts by authors, illustrators, and publishers from the archives held here at the University of Canberra, and to profile the University of Canberra's outstanding alumni whether they are writers, illustrators, or publishers. And I think this evening's event alone will go a long way towards uh, meeting those aims. The Anne Harding Conference Center this evening has been decked out with an exhibition of works from the archives and material from Garth Nix and Maurice Gleitzman, two of our own outstanding alumni whose works I have enjoyed and even read to children of my own. And I was just reflecting, um, I remember the evening when my youngest daughter said to me, Dad, if it's okay with you, I'm quite happy to listen to the cassette tape of Bumface <laughs> and read along um, on my own. And so I was made redundant by what was then uh, new technology, the cassette tape. <laughs> Um, the University of Canberra has uh, many graduates in creative writing who've gone on to become successful authors, including Garth Nix, Maurice Gleitzman, Stephanie Owen Reader, Katie Taylor, who will speak shorter, Ingrid Jonach, and Gina Newton. Uh, this year, the university has established a center for creative and cultural research within our Faculty of Arts and Design to bring together our interest in creative writing with education, cultural heritage, graphic design, publishing, and librarianship. And although it's not specifically about children's literature, um, I should say that we are entering our second year of the UC book, where a competitively chosen work is provided to all first-year students 
and to all staff of the university in a project led by the Deputy Vice-Chancellor of Education, Professor Nick Klump. And the idea is that this book is a talking point throughout the year. This year's book, Room, by Emma Donoghue, in fact has a five-year-old boy as the central character. And the UC book is a further sign of our commitment to literature and creativity. Um, we are grateful to the ACT Government's Festival Fund for supporting this festival and encourage you to take part in other events over the next six weeks. There's more information on our website. So I hope you enjoy the evening, ladies and gentlemen. I will speak to you again to close the proceedings, but now I hand back to the wonderful Emeritus Professor Bell Alderman, that champion of children's literature who will get things underway. We won't hear much from me until the very end when I'll promote more about the Showcase Festival. But I would like to introduce somebody very special, and that's Katie Taylor. <laughs> Katie Taylor is a distinguished alumni of this university, and she came to us in the Lurie's archives as a librarian. And by the time she finished work with us, she said, I'm going to be an archivist, just like all of you. And so she is. She's at the Radford College as their archivist. But I've chosen her because it's very appropriate. He is a Canberra writer at 27 years of age with seven novels. How amazing is that? Oh. So. So Katie, would you please come up and introduce our people, please? Uh, thanks, Belle. Glad I'm wearing antiperspirant today. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so, well, I've got to keep this short and to the point. So, um, I, first of all, I would like to introduce our uh, panel chair, Genevieve Jacobs, who is a very distinguished journalist. She's written about the arts and gardening. She's an afternoon presenter on ABC 666 Radio. And uh, even though radio people are mostly known for their voices, she'll probably be quite familiar by sight to a lot of people around Canberra because she's very heavily involved in events like this. So. Uh, welcome to our panel today, Genevieve. And for our authors, we have Morris Gleitzman. Well, I met Morris Gleitzman a week or so ago at the Distinguished Alumni uh, Award Ceremony lunch in this very room, but technically I had already known him for quite a while because I grew up reading his books. And when I met him, I said to him, you might not like to hear this, but I grew up reading your books. And he said, well, you look like a well-adjusted young lady, so I'm not bothered by that. <laughs> and I said, well, OK, it's just that when I tell people that, they say things like, oh, stop it, you're making me feel old. <laughs> but Morris had the uh, maturity not to be bothered by that, so I, I appreciated that. <laughs> anyway, Morris Gleitzman has worked for a script writer for Australian TV. Um, he wrote The Other Facts of Life, which I watched on TV, as a matter of fact, when I was a kid. Uh, he's quite well known for the series of books about cane toads, of all things, and uh, for his collaborations with uh, Paul Jennings. And, uh, well, he's one of our most prominent and respected children's authors in Australia, so welcome, Morris. And Morris is, of course, also a uh, UC graduate, did the same course as uh, Garth Nix and I, I believe, and he is a distinguished alumni too. So congratulations again for that. <laughs> and our other author here today is Garth Nix. Now, Garth, I have to confess, as a kid, I didn't read your books. It could be because I'm too old, or maybe I just didn't discover them in time. I don't know. But I have actually met Garth before several times, partly because, well, he used to do my agent's job. So. When I was just starting out back in about 2006 with my first book, The Land of Bad Fantasy, she uh, showed it to Garth, who she explained used to do her job. And uh, he wrote back to her saying, um, she has the goods, I say you go for it, or something on those lines. <laughs> and I was so thrilled that when I found out he was going to be in Canberra in the Bocconan Library doing a, a kids event, I, uh, I went there to meet him just so I could say thank you. But I've met him a few times since then at various conventions and things, so you know it's always great to see you again, Garth. And Garth is another of our most prominent Australian authors. He is as um, <clears throat> known for the Keys to the Kingdom series in particular and the Old Kingdom series, among many other books. Um, he is also a UC alumni, and I believe he was a distinguished alumni too. I think, uh, was that mentioned? Well, 
I'm sorry, I should have checked, but yes, also a distinguished alumni. And, um, well, welcome Garth. And for our kids here today, we have Ellie Wedgwood, who goes to Radford College, my, uh, uh, I'm not sure if you can call it an alma mater, but I'm a graduate of, of Radford and now I work there. So uh, welcome to Ellie, who's a keen reader. And we have Ronya Schubert and Heather McPherson from Hawker College, who also both keen readers. And I believe, that, uh, I think Heather, you're a writer, right, as well? If you write stuff, you're a writer. <laughs> Getting paid doesn't really make a difference. <laughs> so, yeah, welcome to Ronya and Heather. <laughs> and finally, we have Amber Quigley from Kayleen High. And Amber, well, I already knew her back when I wore a very different red shirt. And Amber knows what I mean by that. Welcome, Amber. <laughs> and finally, on a personal note, when I was a kid, the primary school that I went to was Miles Franklin Primary, which has a big emphasis on books and writing. And I remember very clearly, even though it's been a long time since then, that I always loved it when we got to meet authors. When we went to author talks or when they came to visit us, I loved it. It was one of, the fa one of my favourite parts and one of my strongest memories of being at that school. So that is what I immediately thought of when I was asked to do this introductory speech, and that's what I'm thinking of now. So um, thank you for being here, everybody, and I think it's really great that we're all here together to celebrate, you know, kids and authors, writers and readers, all of us together. So welcome, and I hope the panel goes well. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I guess that leaves it up to me. Lots of applause, but lots of chat now to come. Welcome. It's wonderful to see such a room full of people, all passionately dedicated to the idea of reading and writing and children's literature in particular. Thank you, Katie, for those very kind, kind introductions. I was lucky enough to speak a little earlier today with both Morris and Garth. They're both good for a great yarn. <coughs> Plenty of chat ahead of us. We spoke more broadly on the radio about their role as writers and their interaction with readers, which is very much at the heart of what we're discussing today. But I actually want to start this conversation with our younger panellists first. And, oh, Ron, you, you get the lucky first go at the microphone. I, I want to start by asking you what you like to read and why. Um, basically anything and everything, <laughs> um, as a lot of people probably um, can relate to. Um, I especially now as I'm getting older, um, more interested in, you know, um, adult, sorry, <laughs> um, more into adult books, um, especially like, um, Melina, Machetta and that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, everything, especially Garth and, um, Morris's stuff, all fantastic. Okay. What about you, Heather? What do you like to read? I'm kind of of the same opinion. I read anything I can get my hands on. But I especially love science fiction um, and fantasy. But I, I mean, if it's, if it's something unique and a different, like a different idea, I will probably end up reading it. But at the moment, I'm very much into classic science fiction. So I'm reading things like lots of Ray Bradbury um, and, you know, Orson Scott Card and stuff like that. That's what I'm trying to get into. Um, but yeah, pretty much everything. I, don't really, you know, don't really have a specific genre. Okay, and let me go over to you, to Ellie. What are you reading at the moment? Um, I'm just reading adventure mainly, because that's probably one of my favourite things in life. And a few other things that, um, I've read a lot of books just about people in life, and it's very, I just love reading, and it's one of my favourite things to do at home, and yeah. Yeah. What about you, Amber? What are you reading now? What do you like reading? Um, at the moment, I'm reading the Sherlock series. Um, I'm a big fan of classics like that, but I do like fantasy and classic sci-fi. Mm -hmm. um, I grew up reading Morris's books, so those were always a big thing for me, but that's about it. Okay. Now, let me ask you what you want out of a book. When you, when you crack open a book by one of your favourite authors, what are you expecting? Ronnie, what, what are you expecting? Um, depending on the book, of course. Um, 
especially love action, 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 action. Um, basically anything that will um, captivate me and have me thinking for quite some time. So I don't, um, I'm, not, I'm not particularly interested in the, um, you know, vampire romance kind of stuff that just has the, <laughs> that just has the uh, top story. There is no depth to it, or there might be. I don't know. <laughs> um, undiscovered at this point. Undiscovered at this point. <laughs> um, but yeah, just any, anything that gets me to think about my own ideas, um, yeah, exploring what I believe of, you know, this sounds deep, the universe and all that kind of stuff, so yeah. Um, Ellie, let me take that question back to you. When you open up a book and you're really excited about reading it, are you looking for adventure? Are you looking for a good story? Do you want to learn something about the world? What are you looking for? Normally it's something that's really interesting and it's normally full of facts. So you, there's facts in the book and um, a lot of just you stick your head into it and you can't get out of the book. <laughs> normally my mum finds me in my room when she's asked me to tidy my room but I'm reading yeah. so... Yeah. <laughs> I might get everyone in this room who has buried their head in a book and not been able to stop to put their hand up. Yeah, that's, that's all of us, isn't it? The entire room is full of people who had their noses in books and were told they would lose their sight as a consequence. <laughs> Heather, <laughs> Heather can, can I go to you? How do you feel about books that have got a message, books that are trying to get a point across about a social issue or a problem that young people might experience? I guess um, they're, very, they're very important because it's an important medium to use um, to get across um, information like that because you don't really, I mean, today things like social media and things like that are getting across important messages but I don't know if it's really affecting everyone so it does um, it's, an, it's another, it's an important medium, I guess you could say, and I really do enjoy it when I, when um, you get books with a deeper meaning that really hits you hard, and so it, and it, you end up feeling like this is a big issue, and I really want to change that, or I really want to do something about that. Um, yeah, it's, I think it's a very important element of a book. Um, and Amber, how do you feel about that? Do you like the idea that you're getting a deeper message from a book or are you really more interested in the story? If I find out that a book has a social meaning or something that relates to me or my friends, I always find that a lot easier to relate to because it gives the book a bit more depth than it might have had before mm -hmm. if it was just a fantasy world. But if it's something a high school girl just said in, said in just about how she lives, and I always find that a lot easier to relate to, and if something happens to her that could easily happen to someone around me, then that's always something that I get stuck into. Yeah, I really like the way all four of you just explode all kinds of ideas about what girls might read, and this idea about adventure and facts and life and all kinds of interesting things, it's fantastic. Um, Morris, I was interested to learn that like lots of people, you wanted to be an author, you wanted to be a writer from quite a young age, but tell me how that turned into an actual reality for you. Well, I actually wanted to be a professional soccer player initially, but, um, <laughs> but uh, I discovered that in life, as, as in stories, that, we, that we're faced with problems and sometimes we can't overcome them, and my problem was that I wasn't very good at soccer. <laughs> so um, I, I, I guess, trod the classic path from being a very passionate reader, somebody who spent much of my childhood in my imagination, courtesy of the authors I like to read, who started around mid-teens to wonder if it was possible to do that as a job. And um, I had a very lucky break when I was 17. Um, well, two lucky breaks. One was that I came here to this university um, having found Australia's first professional writing undergraduate course way back in the early 70s. And <clears throat> the other lucky break was that um, in, in my first year here, I wrote a short story encouraged by one of my then lecturers to not just write at random, but to find a market and write for it. I was at a mate's place. His sister had a whole pile of a particular Australian magazine. I read those magazines. I found that they published a particular type of story. I wrote one of those stories. I sent it off and they published it. And, um, and this, I'm pleased to say this fine magazine is still published today. And, uh, and, I, and I give it a nod of thanks whenever I sit in the news agents. I'm talking about Dolly magazine. <laughs> But 
the all important thing there, and, and, and Garth, I'm guessing Garth has, has had a similar experience because most authors I know have, is that to get that first little vote of confidence, that first little confirmation that maybe, just maybe, you can, your secret dream can apply to you is all important. Mm. Uh, Garth, tell me about the moment when you realised that you could probably do this, that, that this would work. Well, I've had several moments where I thought it might not work as well. <laughs> um, but, but similarly to, to Morris, uh, I, I didn't decide I wanted to be a writer until I was 19. I thought about various other things. And I, I, I left school and I worked for a year and I saved my money and I went travelling, as so many people do. And I went to the United Kingdom first and I bought an Austin 1600, which is a very old car even then, but it had a gold flame stripe down the bonnet, <laughs> which made it go much faster. <laughs> and I drove all around England and Scotland and, and Wales, and when I was doing that, I started rereading a lot of my favourite children's books in the places where they were set. So I read Alan Garner's The Weirdstone, Brisingham and, and On Elderly Edge. You know, so I, I went and tried to find Fund and Delve and chat to the wizard there. Uh, no success. Uh, slightly more success in the Lake District, you know, Arthur Ransom swallows in Amazons. Uh, you know, I hired, a, hired a, a boat and sailed down Coniston Water and I found the island, which it, it, the, uh, the island was based on. I read The Eagle of the Ninth, walking along Hadrian's Wall and so on. So I re-immersed myself in a lot of these classic children's books, English classic children's books that I'd read growing up. And I decided I wanted to try and write something of that kind. But I also had, had always been reading a lot of books about writers and how to write, uh, and particularly science fiction and fantasy writers who classically in the 50s, 60s, 40s, 50s, 60s, started by writing short stories. So I thought, yeah, well, a short story, it's shorter than a novel, so I'll, that sounds like good advice, so I'll start on that. And I wrote a few short stories, and I sent one off to a magazine in the UK, and I didn't hear anything at all. And I came back home after seven or eight months, and... I was, still thinking, I was still trying to work out what I was going to do, but I thought, I, I do want to be a writer. Um, and I found the course here, and I thought, OK, I, I should get a degree so I can get a better day job. I, I've been reading a lot of books about writers, so I knew you needed a day job, you know. <laughs> so that if I get a BA, I can get a better day job, and I can, I can spend my three years, and I can, have, I can learn about writing during the professional writing degree. And while I was planning to do that, I got a telegram, just before telegrams were phased out, from Penguin Books in London that said, have story, Sam Cars and the Cuckoo, which is the name of the story, um, will pay 75 pounds to publish you know, first UK serial rights in magazine Warlock. I'd never sent the story to Penguin. I'd never heard of the magazine Warlock. I had no idea how this story ended up in this particular editor. All I really saw was 75 pounds, <laughs> you know. And I got a telegram, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm probably the last person alive who's got a telegram. Uh, um, it was quite astonishing. I've, I've kept the telegram, actually. I've still got this yellowed telegram. And so that was the start of it. And you're right, it was that affirmation, Morris. Um, and I also thought, well, I'll write a story every two weeks and I'll get 75 pounds or whatever. <laughs> and, you know, it'll be easy. And in fact, I wrote many, many stories over the next five or six years, none of which were published. I couldn't sell any of them for, for years. Um, but as it, as it turned out, the, what had happened was that the editor I'd sent it to at a different magazine had left that magazine. He'd gone to Penguin to start this magazine, which was a, basically a children's, kind of a game. It was a tie-in magazine for the Fighting Fantasy series of books. Um, and he'd taken the story with him. I met him many years later, and he told me that he'd actually taken the whole inventory of unsolicited manuscripts from one magazine with him to this other one, and, and he'd chosen that one. So I bought him a beer and said, thank you. <laughs> I'm hoping you're finding this encouraging, are you? Yeah? <laughs> OK. Um, Morris, um, how different is the reality of being a successful writer to what you might have imagined as a 16-year-old? Very, very different. Yeah. Um, no servants. Um, <laughs> wealth beyond my wildest imaginings hasn't yet occurred, etc. <laughs> I'm always touched, actually, still um, in these more sophisticated times when I'm talking to younger readers, year, year four and five, and when I tell them that I don't drive a Bentley, or rather I'm not driven around in a Bentley and I don't have a house in every capital in, in the world, they just don't believe me. They think I'm just being absurdly modest. Um, but in some ways it's better than I could possibly have imagined because I thought that 
I always imagined growing up would be a largely boring affair filled with responsibility and routine, and to a certain extent it is, but those of us lucky enough to have our imagination as our workplace um, are able to, to be free from that for quite a bit of the time. And I think when you're, well, when I was a kid, I spent a lot of my time in my imagination, but I didn't ever fully appreciate just what a privilege it is to be able to spend that time there because I had a, a, a privileged upbringing where I wasn't worrying about my next meal, I wasn't looking over my shoulder at a predator, I wasn't um, anxious about terrible things happening to family members, etc. Um, so I was free to, to disconnect from my comfortable environment and spend a lot of time in my imagination. But now that I'm older and I know more about the world, I realize that that's actually a privilege and, and, and a wonderful opportunity. And that is the single part of my job that I'm most grateful for, I think, that that's still available to me. Um, although occasionally burning toast and distressed cats kind of call me, call me back to reality. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, and, and I've spoken to lots of colleagues and, um, and many, many other authors I know feel the same way. Mm. Well, let's, let's talk about some of the practicalities of writing and of books. And um, Garth, where does the germ of the idea begin for you? It's a good question because the germ begins in different ways. You know, books begin in different ways and often no two are the same. Uh, some of my books have begun with just a title that's popped into my head and I've not, you know, I've got a title and I've then had to go, well, what is this all about? What is this? What could this book be about? Sometimes uh, books for me begin with a, an image of someone in a, in a place and I have no idea who that person is or where that place is. It's like having a single frame that's been cut out of, a, out of an old film, out of a 35 millimeter film where you have a single frame but you know it is connected to a whole continuing story but you have no idea what that is and then I, I slowly work out, you know, who is that person? Where are they? What is this story going to be? But it's, it's a very incremental process for me, um, and it's never one idea. There's lots and lots of ideas go into a story. You need many, many ideas. And I normally spend at least as long thinking about a book as I do actually writing it. And sometimes that means I spend two or three years thinking about a book, writing notes about it, writing notes, just odd things that crop in my mind. There might be plot notes, there might be character notes, they might be sort of setting notes or background notes. And at some point, everything will sort of coalesce together enough that I'll start writing the book. And normally at that point I'll write, I might write the prologue, I might write a sample chapter, which may or may not ever end up in the actual book. Sometimes those things are an exercise that I, that I don't know it's going to be an exercise, I hope it's going to be the part of the book, because you know, otherwise it's just extra work. But you know, you need to do it. Um, and I'll write that and then typically, then I start outlining. And we were talking about this this morning actually, you know, diff but different writers have very different processes. There's no one way to write a novel. There's no one way to get ideas. Uh, you know, I can tell you how I mostly write novels, um, and you might find something useful in that, but you also might find that you do everything totally against how, how I do it. So I, I'm always very careful with writing advice because uh, quite often you hear authors say, this is how you write a novel, but it's only how they write a novel. It may not, in fact, work for you. I think it's good to pick and choose and, and test things out and see what works. But I, I think with ideas, they don't just pop in your head and there, it's a whole novel. It's, it's that classic, you know, the grain of sand, the irritant to, to the oyster. Uh, you need to accrete lots and lots of different ideas, let them simmer in your imagination, make notes, build things together, let your subconscious work on it, and, and take the time thinking, uh, you know, before you do the writing. Maurice, your books are very much grounded in everyday reality. How do you bring those characters to life? How do you flesh out the bones of an idea and, and, and make it live? Well, m for me, the most important um, dimension of a story is what's going on inside a character in terms of their, their, their thoughts, their feelings, aspirations, what they feel when they look at their, their situation at the beginning of the story and how they use their imaginations to project forward to see what, what the future possibilities might be. Um, and it's out of that process, I guess, often for me, that the, that the story develops. Um, I mostly start with characters. I find those characters inside my imagination. And 
I'm always looking as early as possible in my relationship with them for the biggest problem in their life because I know that the whole story will pivot around that. And sometimes that problem takes my attention into the outside world and I realize that the story is going to be set in a context that is part of our contemporary world or maybe part of our, our, our recent world. But other times it's a less public sort of story. It's about problems that exist in relationships, family, friend, friendship um, problems. And it's, I sometimes think that for me the process of writing is very similar to the process of reading because it, it's, it's about an empathetic co connection that it happens in exactly the same way when we read fiction. We're only going to turn to page two, three and beyond if we've started to connect and care about the characters. And it's the same for me while I'm, while I'm writing a story. Um, also, the most important truths for me exist in, in what people are feeling and what their hopes and dreams are behind those feelings. All fiction writers are very good at making stuff up, at making up the incidents, the physical um, actions that occur through the story. But a book that only has physical actions in it, no matter how spectacular and, and unusual they might be, is going to be worth. Is going to be struggling to hold readers' attentions. I think it's it's that all important inner world of the characters. Mm. And I, I'm really interested in the role that humour plays in your books, because sometimes you've dealt with really quite grim subjects, um, illness, depression, and the like, really difficult situations within families. And yet the phrase that comes to mind for me is, "Well, you've got to laugh, haven't you?" Why do you use humour in that particular way? Um, I have young characters who are facing huge problems in their lives, sometimes problems that we as readers and even they have a sense early on are probably not going to be totally solved. For example, kids in wartime, those kids are facing problems that can't be solved. They can only, with luck, be survived. And I feel a big responsibility to equip young characters with all the personal resources I can. And one personal resource that I like to think is universal among young people, I think it is if they've been allowed to keep it, is optimism. And a lot of my humour comes from the optimistic energies of young characters who will look squarely at some very daunting aspects of the world we share, aspects that we older and wiser folk will give a sigh and say, yes, that's how it's always been and it's how it always will be. But youthful optimism believes that it doesn't necessarily always have to be that way. And there's something about that that makes us smile. And it, and it can be a fond smile. It can be sometimes even a concerned smile. But that I've, I've, I've recognised, looking back on, on a lot of my books, is, is a genesis for a lot of the humour. Yes, and, and there's such warmth in the situations that you develop. Often they're terrible disasters. You know, people's shops burn down and all kinds of terrible things happen. But you're encouraging that, that great sense of humanity in using humour in that way. Yeah, and I think there's nothing helps us empathise with a reminder that, that we all fall short sometimes and that, that what's important is, is to not be, not be daunted. Is, is, you know, stories, I think, inspire us in all sorts of ways and uh, hopefully the disasters we encounter in our stories are bigger than the disasters we encounter in our lives. But when we see characters picking themselves up with optimism and being even more creative in their thinking, even more um, prepared to bend or break the rules to try and get that problem solved or, or improved. It, it's, a, it's just um, something that, that, that makes me smile because I like to think that, that it takes a lot to totally crush and defeat our species. Mm, it's about the human spirit. Ellie and Amber, do you like books to be funny? Ellie, do you enjoy funny books? Yeah, they're, really, they're just funny and you just feel like you want to keep going and you just really enjoy them. Yeah, okay. And what about you, Amber? Do you like humour? Um, I do enjoy humour in books, but I don't like it when a book's fully dominated by humour. Okay. Or, like, I'm not the biggest fan of joke books. More like if it's just, oh, something bad's happened, let's keep going, kind of optimism in humour. Yeah, so you're more interested in humour, as Morris is describing, that's part of a story, part of the humour of ordinary life, rather than something that's a bit sort of slapstick, really forced funny. Yeah. Okay, and um, Ronya and Heather, let me go to you too. What about realism? Are you looking for something that is connected to your everyday life or something that takes you a long way away from Canberra? Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> she asks a pair of teenagers. <laughs> um, I would say that both. 
Um, especially, um, I enjoy realism in a sense that I can easily connect to the characters, which is not, which is not a problem, seeing as how it's humans who are writing the books. But, um, yeah, I, I personally don't have much of a preference over realism, like exactly how it is in my everyday life, or whether it's, you know, on Mars or with Martians and that kind of stuff. Yeah, I, I enjoy all books. And Heather, you mentioned earlier that you read a lot of science fiction, and I, I want to ask Garth about fantasy in just a moment. But how sort of real and human and, and funny and ordinary does it have to be to get your attention? Um, I guess it's a bit of a difficult question, really. I mean, um, science fiction, for me, it does need to have quite a lot of human elements um, for me to be um, encaptured by it. But... Um, because you can't have something so far-fetched that you know it won't happen, therefore it's not really science fiction anymore, it's more in the genre of fantasy. Um, I guess... I don't know how to really answer that question, I'm not really sure myself. Because okay. um, I read... I, I, I'm, I'm being captured by so many different types, like so many different styles of books and things that it's a bit hard to answer. Okay. Um, Gus, tell me how you became a, a fantasy writer and why you became a fantasy writer. I think I, I became a fantasy writer for the very simple reason that I started wanting to write the kinds of books that I most like to read. Though I do read very widely and I've always read absolutely everything. And I think, particularly for writers, that's very important. I think you actually do need to fill the reservoir of your mind with many different kinds of books and many different ways of telling stories. You, you know, you learn lots of different techniques from reading different kinds of fiction, uh, you know, reading the classics, reading contemporary fiction, you know, reading across all the genres. I also think it's very important not to get too hung up on genre or category, you know, about what, what a book, you know, where a book is shelved on a, in a bookshelf or in a bookstore. Um, M. Lincoln Schuster, who is one of the founders of Simon & Schuster, the, the publishing company, uh, wrote a little sort of um, memo to his publishers once, setting out some, some things that he thought were important to them. And one of his most important points was that the worst disease for a publisher is hardening of the categories. <laughs> you know, and I think it's, very, it's, it's true of readers as well, and of writers to some degree, that, that you have to be careful not to judge or evaluate a book by its category or genre, or by the worst example of the genre or category that it falls into. Um, so, you know, science fiction is a very, very broad genre. Fantasy is a very, very broad genre. And it, it, can, it, it can cover an enormous array of really very different kinds of books. Um, but I, I got started, I wrote my first book, the first book I actually finished, that's a whole different other story. Um, <laughs> we could talk about the importance of finishing for professional writers. Um, <laughs> Now, finishing things is so important. The first book I actually finished was The Ragwitch. And that started life because I've always loved C.S. Lewis. I love the Narnia books. But I also felt that you would be much more frightened if you ended up in a fantasy world, you know, age 10 or 11. You know, and you were suddenly in a fantasy world. You'd be petrified. It actually would be much scarier. So I, I wanted to try and write a sort of harder-edged, scary Narnia book. Um, unfortunately, I probably succeeded too well. It was initially pu published as horror in the United <laughs> States. <laughs> You know, I couldn't believe it. Um, you know, I, I, got the, I got the book and it had horror written on the back. I thought, this is, this is, this is my attempt at a children's novel, you know, of, of what they call a middle grade novel in, in the US. It's really that classic, you know, children's, children's novel, you know, period, right? So a nine or a ten year old could pick it up and apparently be scared out of their minds. Um, <laughs> So that was my time. I wanted to, to write a, a children's novel, a children's fantasy novel, but I actually wanted more realism in it, even though it's a fantasy novel, even though it's about two children actually being transported from the south coast of New South Wales into a fantasy world, and one of the kids ends up inside the mind of the antagonist. And that apparently was the really scary part. You know, she's in the mind of a psychopathic creature. What's wrong with that, I thought? <laughs> anyway, um, you know, Live and Learn, that was my first novel. Um, but that's, that's, that's where I started. And I, I just kept going on that path. I, I actually, I have written other things. I write a lot of short fiction, and in, sh and in short fiction, I experiment with doing different things. M a lot more of my short fiction is for adults. But it's nearly always fantasy or science fiction. And when I've tried to write something that is totally contemporary and realistic, 
I nearly always find that it, it, you know, somewhere along the line, something weird creeps in. <laughs> um, and there's only a couple of exceptions. Um, I've, I've written a couple of things uh, which are historical, not, you know, not contemporary. So even then, I'm still going somewhere else. I'm still going to, you know, the past is another country. Uh, you know, it's another dimension, really. Um, so even then, I'm still going somewhere else, uh, not writing something purely contemporary. So I guess it's in my, it's in my bones. But, but you do have to have, within the creation of fantasy, there has to be some kind of, some kind of reality that your readers has, can believe yeah, in. Yeah, there has yeah. to be a lot of reality. Um, now, I, I once at a, a talk I gave, I said, you know, a fantasy novel needs to, to, to be like an iceberg. It has to feel, you know, the 10% that's visible is the novel. But you have to feel like there's another 90% below the surface. There's another whole great depth of reality lurking beneath the story to make the fantasy work. And of course, famously, you know, someone like Tolkien, the other 90% actually was there. He invented it all. <laughs> you know, he wrote, he invented the language, he did all that stuff. I don't actually, you don't need to do that. You don't actually have to have all that other stuff. You just have to feel as if it's there. You have to create that impression. Now, of course, I thought this was wonderfully clever until years later I was reading uh, a book about Hemingway where Hemingway said, all novels should be like an iceberg, you know, 10% visible. So then I just thought, oh, well, it wasn't as clever, but at least I'm thinking like Hemingway. Um, so, you know, um, but yeah, you need a lot of reality. And of course, you know, the best fantasy novels, like any other novel, they're about more than one thing. They have many layers. So you have, a, you have the probably the adventure story is the top layer, but there'll be other stuff going on as well. My novel, Sabriel, is a fantasy adventure story. Um, it's set in you know, two different places, a sort of 1918-ish kind of pseudo-England uh, and another country, sort of semi-late medieval with magic country separated by a wall. You know, so it's a story, a fantasy story about a young woman who goes back to that country with magic. But actually, what the story is also about is it's about a young woman losing her father. It's about the death of her father. It's about coping with the death of, of your only parent and about assuming a great responsibility. So there's multiple levels there. And nearly all good books you know, exist on those multiple layers. They have multiple layers of meaning. And you can read it you know, often very, particularly children's books and young, young adult books. They'll have that top layer and you can read it quite young. You can read 9 or 10 or 12 or 15 you can read it just for the top layer of the story. And then later you can reread it and you can get a whole nother experience because you get the second or the third or the fourth or the fifth layer or the, the multiple layers. To Kill a Mockingbird, you know, a wonderful, amazing novel, is, you know, it has a multiplicity of layers, not just about the characters' lives but about the whole society. You know, there's so many, so many things in a, in, a, in a good book. And that's what really makes classics, I think, and makes books that live a long time. You know, are the multiple layers of, of narrative and of meaning. You know, there's so much there. And they can, be, they can be a fantasy novel, it can be a romance novel, it can be an historical, it can be anything. Uh, you know, it, it doesn't automatically uh, mean it won't have those layers because of its genre. But, but of course, it may also not have those layers. It may just be the vampire story. <laughs> you know. But that said, there are great vampire stories that have a multiplicity of layers. I mean, often in publishing you get trends where you know you get particular books that spawn off many, many imitators, and most of the imitators will only be one layer. They'll be, you know, a millimetre deep and there'll be nothing else. But even that's still satisfying. You know, there's, there's nothing wrong with that unless you're expecting something more. And most of those books don't live on for very, you know, unlike the vampires, they don't live on forever. <laughs> I think the good news now is that we may be over the vampires. I think we're moving on to the zombies. That's my sense of where this is going. Well, it's fairies, actually. It's, it's what? Fairies. fairies. Okay. Or elves. And, Just and that kind of fancy thing. Yeah. And mashups, you know, and post-apocalyptic. So <laughs> post-apocalyptic undead fairies. <laughs> There's no, it won't be mine. <laughs> <laughs> are, are any of our uh, younger panellists, are you into fantasy? Do you like fantasy? Definitely. <laughs> Tell me what the difference is for you between good and bad fantasy. What makes it satisfying for you? Um, as, um, as Garth said, actually, um, with any book, it's that it can appeal to um, a, num a, number of author um, an, a number of audiences um, and that there's different layers in it. Um, fantasy... For me, um, the thing that appeals, like good fantasy apart from bad fantasy, is um, that it's 
it's done in a realistic way, as in I can believe I can believe exactly what the character's going through. I can believe the the world that they're, they're in, basically. Yeah, I think the created world needs to have that level of realism. Mm. Otherwise, you know, otherwise your head sort of slips outside the fantasy, and and somewhere in your sure. head you go, I, oh, it can't be the dragon's fault. That's just ridiculous. I think belief. <laughs> you know, you raise an important thing. Belief is a very important part of it, and. and the author needs to believe in the work. I think this actually applies to everything. You know, if you believe in the story you're telling, then readers will believe in it. And if you don't believe in it, then everyone will be able to tell, you know, almost straight away, I think. Mm. You know, you invest the page with your, your belief. Mm. Um, Am I wrong, Morris? Are you looking at me? <laughs> I'm thinking... <laughs> well, I actually wanted to ask you, Morris, about another world that's completely unfamiliar. And um, one of your books, Boy Overboard, um, took readers somewhere extraordinarily different. Not a fantasy world, <laughs> but the completely unknown one of an Afghan refugee. And in some ways that might as well be on the other side of the world or in a different planet altogether for the people who are sitting in this room largely. Where did you want to take the reader and how did you achieve that? Well, we were, we were talking earlier today about um, how when a reader is taken outside of their very familiar um, life circumstances into a world that is completely different, there are many similarities between that sort of writing and writing fantasy because you need to create um, a, a representation of that world that's believable and that has its same sort of internal logistical consistencies that also has to not betray the truth of, of, of what a particular group of people are experiencing on the real planet too. But, f but for readers, I think the same sort of requirements are there and if somebody was to try and set a story um, in Afghanistan that lacked all of those internal truths and consistencies, then I, I think it would, it would be rejected as quickly by readers as, as, as is bad fantasy. Um, and I say this because um, it was a concern of mine for a long time as I was preparing to write Boy Overboard because when I decided I wanted to try and tell as true a story as I could, or, or as true a representation as I could of, of, of what um, people who were coming to Australia as asylum seekers and refugees from that part of the world were going through and why, why they'd come. I, I, of course, thought that I'd go to, to Afghanistan and, and see, see, go to the source of, of, of what was happening. And my family and publishers formed a veto committee, <laughs> pointing out to me, my publishers, that um, if I went to Afghanistan and got killed, I would be violating several clauses in my contract, <laughs> um, including the one about non-delivery of the manuscript. And, um, <laughs> and it turns out, I didn't even know this, that I had a, I'd at some point in the past signed a contract with my family with similar clauses, which, um, <laughs> which they produced. So I, I wasn't able to go, and, and that was quite confronting because I knew that I was going to be attempting to recreate some experiences that real people were having at that time, very important experiences in their lives, experiences that I hadn't personally had and that I was going to have to try and get into, in, in touch with through doing secondary research. And I did a lot of it, reading, um, talking to people, um, looking at as many images as possible. And I decided to have faith in, in the imaginative process as well. So I wrote a first draft of the book and then knew that I needed to have it checked out by some people who, who really knew how it was. And I, I managed to meet a family who had come to Australia as refugees from Afghanistan, spent time in a detention centre. And after we got to know each other over a period of months and, and I gained their trust, they, they read the first draft of the manuscript and, um, and were able to point out. It took some insisting on my part because there's a great tradition of hospitality and kindness to strangers in that part of the world. And when I came back to their house after they'd read the manuscripts and said, well, tell me, tell me, what's going on? They, uh, Mohammed, the father of the family, said something, words to the effect of Morris, um, this is a glittering jewel of literary perfection. <laughs> and it was about my 15th book, and I'd waited for 14 previous books for somebody to say that to me. <laughs> But the trouble this time was that I knew it wasn't a glittering jewel of literary perfection, and so I had to say, Mohammed, the real act of friendship you can show me now is to tell me exactly all the things I've got wrong in my portrayal of your country. And he took a deep breath, and he did me that act of friendship and told me the 947 mistakes I've made <laughs> in the manuscript. 
whenever you send a book out into the world, to some degree you are opening yourself up to that response, which could sometimes be critical. How do you respond to your readers when they come back to you and say, well, I, I think you should have understood this more clearly, I'm not sure whether you resolved that all that well. Do you take that on board? I do. Um, it's, um, I usually say, why didn't you come and see me you know, before the book was published? Because, um, <laughs> but it, it's, to a certain extent, um, you've got to find a balance as an author between being thick-skinned and sort of shrugging and saying, well, okay, that's another book I've written that isn't the glittering jewel of literary perfection, at least for that reader, and being able to listen and understand why they're saying what they're saying and using it to help you do better next time. Mm. I, think, I think the thing I dread more is not having my, my imperfection as a, as a literary practitioner um, exposed. It's writing a story that is set in a real place at a real time and getting some important stuff wrong. I've, I've written four books about two kids in World War II, in particular caught up in the terrible events of the Holocaust. And I thought long and carefully for, and with trepidation for several years before I started writing these books because the famous edict that I think Primo Levi um, laid down in, in, in the 1950s about the Holocaust, if you weren't there, don't write about it, is, well, one of the ironies is that, of course, if we weren't there, we can't even fully understand why he said that, but we can, we can absolutely appreciate it. And I had to rationalize to myself 50, 60 years later that, um, that the world had changed and that there was a need to, to write about that subject. But I've spoken to other writers of fiction who've, who've set stories against that time. And it's a very, very confronting thing to be, um, to hear from somebody who was there that they don't think you got it right. And I've heard that on a couple of occasions. John Boyne, who wrote The Boyne Striped Pajamas, I've, I've had long conversations with him. He has had some of the, he's, he's had experiences with Holocaust survivors in um, literary talks in New York that still make my, my, my hair stand on in, well, not my hair, but um, <laughs> um, um, my fingernails stand on in just to, um, just to remember it because it's, it's a very risky, and some would say overly presumptuous aspect of this whole business of, of writing fiction. Mm. Ellie, would you ever want to talk to an author and say, look, I didn't understand that, or I think you got that wrong, or you should have changed something? Sometimes. Some books you're like, oh, no, I don't really like that part. But then when you think about um, that more people, like you think about the majority, because a lot of people just think about themselves. But I'm really, yeah. Mm. Do you like books to have a neat tied up ending where everything comes together in the end and everything turns out well? Not really. No? Like what what, what about you, Amber? Do you like a, a neat, tidy ending? Um, if everything's resolved, then there's nothing really to keep you thinking about it. I like the books where there might be one or two problems left or even if the main problem hasn't been solved, there's all the little ones have been tied up and there's just something that keeps you thinking and keeps you wondering about the characters and hoping if there could be a sequel or... Yeah. And look, I, but a I, mess I, makes me unhappy. <laughs> yeah, there's just the those end. moments where you just think, where is the sequel? Yeah. <laughs> well, Garth, I, I ask that because, of course, a lot of your books have been series. So that, that's a really interesting feel for a writer to explore as well, that you feel there's more than one book in this and there's more than one way to explore this world. Why have you done that as an author? Um, I, I seem to actually always end my books with the possibility of other books, mm. um, even the ones where I've thought, that's it, it's completely finished. I'll still get emails saying, you could do something else. And I'm thinking, from your publisher, no, I can't. presumably. <laughs> well, no, that's for, just from readers. I mean, I was, I was like, just talking about criticism, it, it's interesting, it's going, it's going back just one step. It just reminded me, I got a letter once from a boy who wrote me a five page letter about everything that was wrong in every single one of my books. <laughs> All of which he'd read very carefully, yes. you know. And it's just—it's funny how how these the, how these these reactions can happen. Yes. Um, but with sequels, I mean, uh, a lot of my sequels I didn't plan at, at first necessarily, and I'd, I'd I'd write other books in between, and then I'd get an idea and want to go back, you know, to that world. Uh, the Keys to the Kingdom was entirely planned as a series. It's really, you know, one very big story told in seven volumes. So that one I deliberately did do it, and I've sworn never to do it again. Uh, because 
it, it took too long. It was eight years, basically. It should have been seven, but you know, obviously I ran out of puff somewhere along the way. Um, but I, I do seem to instinctively leave some threads, and I think it's part of the iceberg thing, that you know, s stories in re real life doesn't ever tie up completely neatly. There's always threads left hanging. And so I, I think in nearly all my stories, I do leave some threads you know, untied, unsnipped, to then I could come back to them. Or in the middle of the book. Um, and I've actually, my, my, my next book, not my, well actually my next major big book next year is a book called Clariel, which is another book set in the Old Kingdom. Um, it's like a 600 year before prequel to Sabriel. And it's about one of the secondary characters who crops up in Lyriel and Porson. So, and I, I didn't think I had an idea for that character when I wrote those books. But a few years you know, afterwards, I was, I was looking back through it and I thought, I've completely set up this character to write her initial early story without even really thinking about it. So there's a lot of subconscious setting up for other stories. Uh, you know, it makes them easy, easy to return to. And I think a fantasy, when you're writing about an invented world, often lends itself to that as well, because you are writing about a whole world. And so there are other stories that cross and, and you know, pass by and you can come back and that little, you know, I guess it's like a film where you know, you've got the foreground action and then something happens in the background. I've gone back and I've gone and looked at the background action and said, hmm, that person in the crowd at the back, yes, you, I'm writing a, I'm writing a story, I'm going to write a story about them. They are, they are the new main character. But that comes back to realism, doesn't it? Like that life continues even after a chapter is finished. Mm. Or so. yeah. And I think, I think Amber um, touched on something really important there because when we're, when we're writing stories, when we're, 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 we're asking our stories to be read, we're, we're inviting readers to open their imaginations and to allow a process to happen, to cause a process to happen in their imaginations. And if we accord readers the ability to, to play their part in bringing this story into being, which is for it to happen in their imagination, I think we should also accord readers the ability to continue their own personal relationship with those characters after, and to, and to, and, and as, exactly as you said, to take some unresolved threads and start having creative future possibilities themselves with those and characters. And this is fan fiction. You yeah, know, I mean, yeah. there, there is so much fan fiction written around you know, popular books. I'm sorry, Heather's you know, just put let's a not, terrible, terrible place <laughs> let's, there. Let's, let's yeah. not go there. Let's, <laughs> Let's talk about fan I think fiction. Fan, I think fan fiction might be taking it one step too far. I think we can just, I think we can probably just yeah. keep you it within our it own, your own head. Yeah. yeah, I don't think we necessarily have to sort of fill up the, the, um, the, the internet with, um, no, anyway, that's just my personal view. <laughs> it, it occurs to me that you've just put forth a beautiful metaphor for the end of this conversation because we've talked about sequels, about ideas being chased down, more books to be read, more ideas to be had. It's been a wonderful discussion and I think we've had great input from our younger panellists as well, from Ellie and Amber and Ronya and from Heather. And from Garth and Morris, it's wonderful to draw on this enormous depth of experience you both bring to this. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you, Genevieve, um, for uh, emceeing that, that wonderful discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, we've had a, a fantastic evening, I think, tonight. We've heard from four young people who are avid and passionate readers. We've heard what they like and why they like it. We've heard from two of Australia's leading authors for young people, what led them into it. In Morris's case, we've heard about the strategic career importance of Dolly magazine. Um, <laughs> In Garth, I, Garth's case, I can still I can see you driving an Austin 1600 in Scotland, the Lake District, and Hadrian's Wall, and that bit resonated with me because the house that I grew up in, Hadrian's Wall finished in our back garden, not surprisingly in the suburb of Wall's End. Um, we've heard about the magazine Warlock. We've heard possibly for the first time ever the word telegram used in this building. Um, <laughs> We've heard about optimism as a glue which holds a plot together and that wonderful expression that imagination is my workplace. 
even with the OHS issues that there may uh, be accompanying it. We've heard about the creative process, how the germ of an idea um, coalesces into a book, and the sclerotic danger of hardening of the categories. So, ladies and gentlemen, for a funny, serious, and stimulating panel um, discussion, please join me in thanking them once again. Anything after that would just be anticlimactic, right? That was absolutely so amazing. And I'm, I just feel privileged to have been here. And I hope that the rest of you feel exactly the same way. Looking at your faces and your smiles, I know that this was an important evening. So Showcase, the second annual festival of Australian children's literature here at the University of Canberra and elsewhere in the community. We hope that we'll have another one. Fingers crossed. We're waiting to hear whether we got a grant. Now, if you've enjoyed tonight, we hope that you will join us for 20 other various speakers around Canberra. So be sure that you pick up a showcase flyer and go to the University of Canberra website and just put showcase at the end and you'll see all these fabulous people, their biographical profiles, all the details. Be sure to book in because, of course, this one booked out and that's the high point, isn't it, to book out. Now I'd like to do a little bit of thank yous to those who've assisted with Showcase. Firstly, it couldn't happen without funding from the ACT Government Festival Fund, we're very grateful. The University of Canberra also helped us with a centenary grant and that enabled us to do a little bit more than we might have been able to do. I'd like to thank you Stephen for officiating, that was absolutely wonderful. You say thank you in a way that really no one else can do, so thank you. I'd like to thank Garth and Morris. It's just been absolutely fabulous to have them here together. What an amazing show of, of wit, of wisdom, of storytelling. Thank you so much. The young people, Ranja Schubert from Hawker College, Heather McPherson from Hawker College, Amber Quigley from Kayleen High School, and Ellie Widgewood. Well, you were just fabulous too. Thank you so much for giving us your insight. I'm sure that I could never have done what Genevieve Jacobs did. She did an absolutely fabulous job of keeping it all going, and we're very, very grateful for that. A special thank you to Katie for introducing the speakers in such a wonderful, unique way. Thank you very much. Outside this theatre, you saw the exhibition of framed artworks from the Lou Reese archives, and I'd like to thank Virginia Mitchell, who's the new university manager of the artwork collection here, who came along and we discovered we both love children's books, and I said, you wouldn't really just possibly happen to be interested in putting together, oh, yes, yes, yes. So I'd like to give her a special thank you as well. There are also exhibitions of Garth Nix and Morris Gleitzman's works out in the foyer, and those were done by Belinda Gamlin and Rose House. Thank you very much for doing those as well. <laughs> and I'd also like to thank the UC for supporting this opening event, especially Inga Davis. Thank you very much for all your encouragement. 
But as we all know, things don't happen smoothly. And yes, you have a very good support team behind you. And I must say that I've had the most amazing professional association with the alumni team of any group. So I'd like to especially thank Arpana Bathra, Joel Wise, and Chiara Rumble. Thank you so much. You made it all possible. And I'd also like to thank, if you notice the beautiful graphics uh, that's on the banner outside and on this one, this was done by Amber um, Stanley, who is absolutely one of the most talented artists I know. Um, and I'd like to thank her for, for giving her special talents to tonight and for the whole showcase. And the last thank you goes to you for your coming and sharing with us this evening.